Hello and welcome to a very special bonus episode of Musicals with Cheese. And today I have the incredible composer, book writer, lyricist, um, Paul Gordon. Great to be here. And it's great to have you here. And we're going to talk about a lot of things um, leading up to his entire career and almost every project he's done. It's going to be a great time. So thank you for joining me, Paul. It really is a pleasure to meet you. Happy to be here. Mm-hmm. So the first question is, we're going way back right here. When you were young, did you have an adoration for musical theater or was it something you developed as time passed? I actually did. You know, my parents were big musical theater fans, even though we lived in L.A. So we never I never got to see a, a real live show. But, you know, we watched uh, My Fair Lady and West Side Story and they took me to movies and and so I, I and, and they played the records as I was growing up. And then in the eight in, in the fifth grade, I saw an eighth grade production of Bye Bye Birdie at um, at my school. And I was literally blown away. I just couldn't believe it. Like these kids on stage singing and and it was a story. And, and of course, I'd seen movies, but somehow the experience of seeing live theater at that age, even eighth graders, which I thought eighth graders were the best actors in the world for many years after that. But it was it was just an experience that I really think changed my life. Mm -hmm. And so that was your come to Jesus moment of this is what I'm going to do. Truly, so to say. It, it, it truly was. Mm -hmm. And so when you went into like post post high school, you went straight in for musical theater. Or was there some other things that you were considering as well? No, I actually had uh, I was really focused on being a pop artist and being in bands and, and doing pop music. And and I had pretty good success uh, as a pop songwriter uh, in, in, in the late 80s and the 90s and had a couple of hit songs. But I just got very, you know, uh, I just didn't I didn't care for the industry. I didn't care for the pop music industry. And I'd loved musicals and I'd always dabbled in writing them. And I wrote a rock musical um, that I did with Pamela Adlon and Katie Seagal and, and, and some other fun people. And, and, but I'd never really you know, had any connection to musical theater until I started working on Jane Eyre and through that met John Caird. Mm-hmm. And you wrote a wonderful article about your development of Jane Eyre. I was wondering if you could elaborate on how that came to be and whether or not you took like musical inspirations from other composers while writing it. Because it feels like its own thing. Like You can't compare it to anything else that was currently going on at that time period. Oh, that's uh, thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. Well, you know, I, I, I sort of grew up inspired, as, as I was saying, by pop music and and specifically the Beatles and the Beach Boys and Paul Simon and but then in in high school I discovered Stephen Sondheim and that completely riveted me and 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 sort of sort of put me on a different course and it was really little night mu hearing a little night music and just getting saturated with the harmonic brilliance of Sondheim which also sort of integrated into my love of pop music and 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 the Beatles and the Beach Boys and 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 that sort of music and and so whatever I'm creating is just a culmination and an amalgamation of all of those different influences. Mm -hmm. All right. And so you said you basically wrote out this very long piece of Jane Eyre and then sent it to John Carrot. Is that correct? Yeah. So I, I guess back to your original question is that I, I had written an original musical that was sort of a rock musical that 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 we did in L.A. for a few years. But then when I saw Les Mis and I didn't know John yet, I was pretty knocked out by the uh, by the spectacle of it and the direction of it. And I literally said to myself, you know, I want to work with these people. And it was kind of unbelievable that 10 years from saying that. I was on Broadway with the the, the director and, and the designers, and it was just a, an incredible journey. But initially, I just wanted to see if I could create a musical based on a novel in the public domain. And I chose Jane Eyre. I didn't really wasn't really familiar with the with the novel, but I was really determined to write a story about a powerful woman. And I wanted a story that would uplift audiences. And I just started reading Jane Eyre and I was crying by page 10. And I 
And I really had to force myself to read the entire novel before I started writing because it was so inspiring to me. And as soon as I finished, I spent a year and I wrote the piece and I sort of demoed it as I wrote it. And I happened to know um, a, a friend of mine was in the L.A. company at the time of Les Mis, and she was understudying Eponine, and she became my Jane on the original demo, Sally Dworsky. And she knew Anthony Crivello from the show. And Anthony came in really late in the project in the demo process, and he played a servant um, and sang maybe on the last song. And he said, listen, my friend John Caird should hear this. And I said, sure. And he got the the cassette to John Caird, who happened to be in L.A. at the time with his then wife, Frances Raffel. And I remember going over to his little rented house in his backyard and he had my script and he was correcting my spelling with a red pencil. And and, and he was like looking at my script going, well, this isn't this isn't British and this is 20th century. And he basically wanted me to rewrite the show and make it set in America in the 1920s. And I very politely said, no, I'm really not interested in that. And when I think about saying no to him now, I just cringe <laughs> because he could have just walked away from the project, but instead he said, all right, well, let's do it this way. But I would have to be the book writer if I was gonna direct this. And I went, okay. Like that was the greatest thing I'd ever heard. The director of Les Mis wanted to write the book and direct my musical. And I had no Broadway cred whatsoever, no theater cred, but he recognized something and, and it was incredible. And, and we, you know, we talked about the piece for a few days and he suggested two songs to me, two song ideas. And literally the next day I came back and played him Brave Enough for Love because I was so inspired by what the notes that he'd given me. And we didn't have the ending song and I just wrote it. And he, I could tell that that sort of, that sort of um, made our relationship pretty solid. And we started working together and, and you probably know the rest. Mm -hmm. And now I want to ask you a couple of questions about your adaptation process, because uh, many years ago I did a video all about Jane Eyre, it, the musical specifically, and I talked about how incredible it was that you took just straight up lines from the Bronte's novel and you mu musicalized them so eloquently, but still made them rhyme and fit into a meter and still sing. And I want to know, is there a process for doing that? Because you do it so well in a level of, say, like someone like Dave Malloy um, more recently. and a lot of people have a difficulty with that. So I was wondering what your process is for that. Oh, well, thank you. That's, uh, that's, that's very nice of you to say. Um, I, you know, for me, it, it, it's really the luxury of getting to be inspired by some of the greatest writers of our time, Jane Austen, Charlotte Bronte, Oscar Wilde. It, looking at their prose on a page when I was reading Jane Eyre the first time, certain lines just jumped out at me as lyrics deep in my secret soul. I believe I took that right from the book. And, and I'm sure you might mm -hmm. and know other lines that I got directly from the novel, but they always felt musical to me. But the trick, of course, is you can't just take prose and make them a song because they just won't they won't rhyme and they won't sing. Mm -hmm. So it's really taking one or two thoughts lines and if you can make one or two lines sing that's great but it, then it's just it's just making the rest of it feel organic to what you've started and with charlotte bronte i would just look at passages and and um and and words and just get ideas and well that's saying well that's a nice idea but maybe not that word but something like it and i and i really mm -hmm. try to come as close as i can to using using the author's words because you can't get better than what they wrote. But when you musicalize something, obviously it becomes something else. And obviously certain things will sing and certain things won't. So that becomes the challenge in trying to make beautiful phrases that you love into lyrics. And that is quite an intricate process, but I find it really challenging and really fun. And ultimately, when the lyric is done, it has to be my own because it has to fit on music. But it's always the, the initial inspiration is from the author. And, and, and that's, that was the great joy of transitioning from pop music to musical theater. In pop music, I found that I was writing about myself a lot. 
and I got pretty bored with myself. And 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 then when I when I started to read Jane Eyre and and the brilliance of Charlotte Bronte's prose and realizing that I had this whole new universe that I could draw on lyrically. I mean, I think it just made me a better writer because I, I just it was it was just something so entirely different from what I was used to. And so I relish that now and I and I find it a great joy to take literature and 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 find the music and find the tone and find the lyrics. Mm -hmm. And I think you use that the most beautifully in the proposal scene specifically, because in most versions of Drain Air and the adaptation process, um, they just take it straight up and it feels hard to get out. But you've changed it in very specific ways while keeping almost every single section of that proposal scene accurate to the intention, at least. And I think it's the best version of that scene ever like performed. Oh, thank you. Well, I mean, I think it's just there in the novel on the page. It, it was why would you make it different? And, and of course, that one section where she's talking about herself and. And, mm -hmm. and how she feels about herself was so powerful, I went, that can't be sung, that just has to be spoken. So the challenge in that moment was which parts do you speak, which parts do you sing, and how do you make it so that you don't even know that you're singing or you're speaking, it just all feels like one thing. And that's what feels very satisfying about that moment musically and, and, and dramaturgically, and why I think it's effective is that is that, I, is that I was able to go from exactly what Charlotte Bronte is saying to lyricalize, lyricizing what she was saying. And, and I, I hope that that was effective. Yes. Um, now, here's just a curious question for me. What song in Jane Eyre was the most difficult to write and why? Um, Rochester's song at the end, Farewell, Good Angel, was the most difficult song because I didn't want to write a song there. And... And actually, in the new chamber version that John Karen and I are creating, I've in fact cut that song. Um, oh no! <laughs> I know. I know a lot of people will be upset, but I just felt like it was. It was. It, we sort of. Not only did we sort of know what he was feeling, I, I just felt like that that the music was just created to be a dramatic moment that was overkill for me, and so I just never really loved the song. And I'm trying to remember what we replaced it with right now, and I can't remember, but you're going to find out in a few months when we release the new chamber version of Jane Eyre. <laughs> All right. Um, how would you describe your first experience, like your experience taking your first musical to Broadway? Like do, when you look back on it, do you look back fondly? Like, or do you see like a lot of trials and tribulations or things you would have done differently? I look back on it now with just so much gratitude that. I had that opportunity because, you know, I was just somebody that didn't necessarily have those connections to New York and somehow it happened. And, you know, it would, it took 10 years from the time I wrote the first note to opening on Broadway, literally within a week of, of a, a 10 year journey. And certainly there were moments when we were on Broadway that were very challenging. Certainly, um, previews were really challenging because I knew what we needed to fix creatively. I think we all knew, but because of the technology that we were using with our design, we were not able to make the changes that I think would have really made the show even better. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I, that, was, that was incredibly frustrating for me as a writer and as an artist at the time because I understood what the process was. And I understood that we needed those previews to really glue the show together and make those final changes. And we had so much time and yet we couldn't really do that work. So that was the real challenge I had. And of course, that the show was sort of short lived and we opened the same season as the producers, all of that, you know, gave me a lot of heartache while it was happening, but so much joy to create a show like this that so many people appreciated. I was there in the audience. I saw how people responded to the show. I, I knew what we did. And, and, and so that still remains one of the great highs of my life, getting the opportunity to bring Jane Eyre to, to Broadway and all that it's given me since I've, you know, since 2000 and, and, and we had the opportunity to do the show there. 
nearly 20 years later, are you surprised at the legs that that musical has had and the fact that it's still performed, like, recently, like, in my hometown, there's a production of Jane Eyre the Musical coming out, so I was just wondering what, how, as someone who's come from pop music, what is your reaction to that? Well, I'll, I'll first answer that question by telling you my reaction to something my agent said to me, um, I think it was at the Tony Awards or closing night of Jane Eyre, I can't remember, he said, well, you know, maybe there'll be a revival in your lifetime. Um, and, I, <laughs> and I remember this word struck me as like, yeah, but what's happening now? Um, so so I, I, I didn't know what the future really was for the show or for myself. I, I mean, I, 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 I took the closing pretty hard, as, as you might imagine, because I, 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 it was just, it was like shocking to me that we're not even going to tour and it's just ending and nothing's happening. And so it was, it was a pretty rude awakening for me. But, you know, again, I, I, I'm, I, I, the fact that the show has lived on and the fact that, that John and I are still working on it. We just did a production in Cleveland last year with um, uh, these two lovely um, young director and producer, Miles Sternfeld and Sean Patrick. And, you know, we're trying to um, really bring the show back in the version that John and I have always wanted to do, a, a, a smaller chamber version where it's really about the storytelling and the music and not about a big production and a design and a spectacle because the show was never about that. It was always about the emotion of the show. So I'm excited to bring it back and I hope people are still interested in, in hearing the story. I just, just, you know, a timeless story and, 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 I, and I'm happy to share it with people again. Is there any chance that it might be a streaming musical in the near future, not to jump ahead of time too much? I would say there's a very good chance, um, if I'm still on the earth in a year or so, yes. I mean, I'm determined to do that. So I would say that's a, even though there are no specific plans and dates that, that are happening, I will tell you that, I, that that is going to happen. You heard it here first, folks. Let's yeah. talk about the first ever live stream musical of all time now. Um, Daddy Long Legs. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> what would you like um, to know? How, I want to know how the production started. What made you decide this is the topic I want to write about? Like, where did it start? I would say of all of my shows, that was the one show that that was not my idea. Um, that was uh, Malko Caird's idea, John Caird's wife, who grew up in Japan. And in Japan, Daddy Longlegs the Novel by Gene Webster um, was incredibly popular. Whereas in this country, most people have never heard of it or they know the Fred Astaire movie that has basically nothing to do with the novel. And so I never heard of it. And John said, there's this really sweet novel that we think we could just make a very sweet musical you know, a two person musical. And I said, great, send me the novel. And, you know, I read it in a day, it was very easy to read. And I just fell in love with the idea of it. And I just, and I created it as a one woman musical, I was determined to have it be a to, to, to be performed by one woman anywhere. And and that was my idea. And I wrote it that way. And John went, God, this is really good. This is some of your best work. But no, um, this is going to be with two people and you're ha going to have to write the other part. And I said, but I don't know what his voice sounds like. I, I, you know, in the novel, it's just her. So I said, guess what, John, you're going to have to invent him. And he did. And he created this language and he didn't create any songs. He just created dialogue and, and speeches for him. And I went, oh, this is so great. You're going to hate me because I'm going to take your speeches. I'm going to plagiarize it and turn it into a lyric and a song, which I did. And and that and that that ended up being how Jervis evolved musically. John wrote these great monologues and I musicalized them and we completed the other half of the story. But I have to say it took us many years to figure out how to tell the story. It sounds so simple when you see it now, you think, oh, this was always how it was meant to be told. But there was a moment halfway through this journey where I remember John and I sitting, having dinner. He just went. I don't know how to write this. I just don't know how. And I just went, I don't know either. And we were lost, um, but somehow he figured it out. And then when he began his, um, you know, uh, collabor collaboration with David Farley, the designer, uh, you know, things just really started to come together magically in terms of 
we knew what the piece was going to look like and, and, and venting the trunks and, you know, Megan McGinnis and, 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 and what she gave to, to the show and what, what, you know, all of her brilliance and, and, and what we learned from her, from her journey as an actor going through this journey as Jerusha for many years, you know, it was a unique situation where the piece really got to evolve and change in, in, in a very relaxed way. I mean, even though we had moments of, we don't know what this is, it wasn't under pressure. It wasn't like we were opening in two weeks and we didn't have a show. It was really like, what is the show? And it took us years to discover what it was. And, you know, good theater, I think, sometimes takes a long time. It's just, you think you're ready and you think you've written a show and then you realize you're not ready and it's gonna be a couple of more years and it can be grueling, but in the end, you hope it's worth it. Mm -hmm. So, in the writing process, what song came to you the easiest and which one came to you the hardest? Because you've got only two characters, which is both freeing and limiting in a way. So I'm just curious how that what that was like ah, you know the first five songs of the show came really super fast because i was re excited about it i just read the novel and i just felt like i i knew what these songs sounded like and what they were supposed to say um and then there's always a point after that first initial creative rush that then you go all right well what's the rest of the show supposed to sound like so i guess when i got to um you know, when she goes to New York and that section, I wrote a song in the original version called Here on the Streets of New York. It was a really hard song to write, but I really loved it. And and so that was really difficult. And but then when we started to perform the song, it just never sounded it never sounded right. It never fit in the show. It never sounded as good as my demo for some reason. It was just one of those songs that I we just couldn't get right live. And and Michael Jackowitz, uh, one of our producers, uh, said to me, you know, I think you can just write a better song. And um, and then when we got to New York uh, for the off-Broadway production is when I went, well, yes, but I don't think it's her song. I think it's his song. And that's when I wrote My Manhattan. And that song came very quickly once I decided that that was the song it needed to be. So so the old song came came it was really challenging, but the new song, when it went, once I decide I was going to write it on guitar and I was going to write it for Paul Nolan's voice and it was for Jervis for that same moment, it came out pretty quickly. That's, that's fantastic. Um, so you were working with John Carrot again, like how was your relationship since Jane Eyre and developing and like being constant collaborators? Um, you know, when I first met John, you know, I was, humbled by him i mean he was extraordinary i mean arguably one of the greatest directors in the world and here i was mm -hmm. hanging out with him having dinner and so it, it was a bit of an adjustment he's also one of the smartest people i've ever met in my life and it can be intimidating being around him so it took me a while to get comfortable because in order to have a true a true collaboration with somebody you have to be comfortable being able to suck being in the room with them, meaning you have to be able to come up with an idea that's terrible and feel comfortable and not humiliated and embarrassed. And and then the next phase is you have to feel comfortable yelling at them and, and in a loving way. And and John John has has started as my collaborator, my friend, and now he's really my older brother because I lost my brother a few years ago. And John sort of filled that void in my life. And so we're, we're more than friends and we're more than collaborators. And, you know, he's one of the most important people in my life. And yet when we were in Tokyo recently working on a film, uh, on a show, we wanted to kill each other in a good way. Um, but, but that's what happens with collaborators and brothers. And so we very much have that relationship and I'm so grateful for it. Mm -hmm. And that that's I, I love collaborators that stay collaborators, but are able to fight because I understand that. I it, it makes me so sad when you have like the Tim Rice, Angel Lloyd Webbers that just break up and then yeah. things aren't ever quite right again. Yes. So seeing you guys still working together and still working on things that like most people don't even know about, like that's that's true artistry and love there. And I love that. Um so how would you describe your experience and honor of being the first live stream musical? <laughs> um, I'm completely... And how'd that come about? It was so funny, you know, because 
uh, Ken Davenport. Um, this was his idea. The show was lagging in business, and he was trying to think of producerial ideas to to get the to get the show going. So he thought of this idea of we would be the first show in New York to do a live stream. And when he told me that, I thought, all right, great. But I I didn't really think anything of it. And I was already pretty sick of seeing the show, and I knew I was going to have to go and and watch it that night. You know, you do a show, and 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 you've been working on it for ten years, and and suddenly you can't even watch it anymore. Your your eyes are glazed over. So my wife and I went to the show. Live stream was there. We saw these two guys with cameras. Never seen the show before. It was a good performance that night. And you know, I just sort of forgot about them. Uh, you know, 10 minutes into the show. So we get home from the show and they're doing the live LA feed. They did a New York feed, an LA feed, a London feed and a Tokyo feed. So we start watching the LA feed and I'm on the couch. I'm sitting on the arm of the couch and my wife is watching on her computer. And I just said, I'm just going to look at it for two minutes just to make sure I'm not embarrassed. So I'm looking at it and I'm going, hey, this sounds pretty good. And then I say, this looks pretty good. And I literally watch the whole thing. I'm mesmerized and I get an idea. I just went, this could be the future. Like this could be an enjoyable experience for people that can't get there, that would have no way to see theater. Like it wasn't an idea of like, hey, let's per- replace live theater. It was the opposite. How can we help live theater? So I had the idea of why can't we do this? And why can't we? you know, sell these on the internet and, and, and actually change the rules of the business. Because, you know, what the internet has given us artistically, you know, besides everybody thinks everything is free, um, but it has leveled the playing field. Um, and, it, and it has given artists a certain opportunity they didn't have before the technology was available. So my first thought was, what if we did these, shot these musicals regionally off Broadway and um, created royalty pools for the actors, for the designers. And people could actually be paid the same way they're paid in film and television. And we could make these affordable. And then regional theaters that have such difficulty doing new work because the music man sells better, they could actually have a different financial um, income stream because they could then you know, sell the stream and, 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 and find an audience for their show and then do the show again in three years. It made so much sense. I got so excited and I, you know, got together with, with, um, my partners, uh, Tom Pollum, Stacia Fernandez and Larry Lelly. And, you know, we talked to the unions for a couple of years, um, but they didn't respond as quickly as we wanted them to. So what we did is we tried a different model, which was Filming a show on a soundstage or in a theater without an audience, but you film it with um, you film it in 4K HD with two or three cameras, and you film each scene for two hours, and you do something that's totally new. You do a hybrid of a stage show and a, and a film, and suddenly I started to like this idea much better because I loved the control I had artistically, and I loved the fact that we were going to do something new. We were actually going to create a new form of musicals that wasn't a film musical, wasn't a TV musical, wasn't a stage musical. It was something different. And we decided to call it a soundstage musical for just lack of a better title. And with Emma, what we did is exactly that. We went into the West Side Theater with three cameras. Um, Kent Nicholson and Tip Kashani co-directed and we went in there with a film crew and we lit it kind of like a film, but like a theater piece. You see the theatrical lights. We weren't trying to hide it, but we're also cutting it like a movie and we're shooting it like a movie. And the way we did the music was really cool for me. Um, for Emma, we just had uh, a, a piano generated by a computer. Um, and then we did all of the live instruments in post. Uh, we went to the studio with live cello, violin, and, and then we did um, some programming and some enhancement. Um, and, and I have to tell you that it was a completely satisfying experience uh, musically and sonically and, and to create the piece, you know, in a particular way. And even though we will all admit Emma's not perfect, it was the first one we did. We're super proud of it. We've discovered something. 
it's, it's, it's a way to tell a story musically that works and you can watch it on your computer and artistic directors can watch it on their computers. And that's the other point of the model, especially for my peers, for, for people that write and, and compose musicals. Now, as you know, not every musical is gonna go to Broadway. Not every musical is for Broadway or for off-Broadway, and it's expensive. So we're creating an entire new model that's much less expensive than the model that exists now where more people can be paid forever and more people can see your work. I like to say that you know when you open your show in a stream, your show never closes, there are no running costs, and your, your audience is not just the regional market where your show is playing, it's the entire world. So you can tell I am super excited about this idea and this model because creatively we can see more shows, we can create more shows, and, and, and people can discover musical theater who would never have an opportunity to do it before. You can, you know, there's an, an entire generation, as you know, growing up that may never walk into a theater, but they will look at their phone, they will look at their device. And if we can create content from our art form that's exciting, that we're presenting it in a new way that looks good and sounds good and people are getting paid and it's fair, then I think that that's the best of all possible worlds. And I agree. Even in the episode that proper of musicals, which he's that we did on the musical No One Called Ahead, we just couldn't help getting off a tangent about how awesome it is that this is just musicals made for streaming and how accessible it is because, like, everyone is getting a fair deal out of it. Absolutely. Like, we couldn't help but talk about how great that was. Right, because we're all frustrated. I mean, listen, we love Broadway, we love Off-Broadway, but let's face it, Off-Broadway, it's like when I'm asking a producer for money for Off-Broadway, I say, I, you could give me money for my Off-Broadway show, or you could light it on fire, because there's no difference. And unfortunately, that that's real. And, and, I, and I said, there has to be a better way to create musicals that where people don't lose, where, where like, if everybody loses, and, and that's the only game in town, and only one person can win or only two people can win, that's just not fair. And that's just not the way for art to flourish. So I think with this model, we have the opportunity as an industry to change the rules again and to make things more fair. And I hope people, because other people are gonna do this. We're not saying that streaming musicals is the only person in the world that can do this. There's obviously Broadway HD and there's other people doing it, but we would love people to know what our model is and the fairness of it and to pay, the, and, and, and to be able to pay the, the artists in perpetuity. Because the way we're able to do these cheaply is everybody gets favored nations. You know, we're not paying big salaries because everyone is taking the same risk. The producer, the the actors, and what we say to the producers is, look, you're not going to get your money back before an actor gets their money back. Because guess what? Even though you're giving us something hugely valu valuable, your money, you know, this actor has put 10, 15 years into their craft, auditions, you know, heartbreak, doing their craft. They're taking a risk too. We're all taking a risk. And this is the way to make everything even. And that's what we hope to achieve with Emma and No One Called Ahead and, and future projects that we're going to put out in the world. And you're also working with Apple and Orange's Arts, which is what put on the productions. And they're also doing the Theater Accelerator, which is helping find new musical theater artists and helping them develop their shows, which is incredible as well. Yes. And I can't say enough about Tim Kashani and Pamela Kashani. Um, you know, when we were starting this, uh, Tim had been involved in Emma several years ago when we were trying to get it to Broadway and we were trying to do the math and we couldn't make the math work out. So um, I called Tim when we were doing this sort of digital version to see what his interest was. And it was just perfect timing because with Theater Accelerator and what he was working on, it just lined up perfectly with his whole thought process, which is to take starving out of artists, which is exactly what streaming musicals was doing. So there was a perfect opportunity for a partnership here to blend our two worlds and, and to create what we've created. And, and really, this is just the beginning. We're just, we're just figuring this out now. And the next one's going to, we're going to make it even better because we just learn, oh, 
this was cool. That was a good idea. Hey, maybe that wasn't the greatest way to do that. Let's change that next time and do this better. So, and Tim is so wonderful with that. And um, so I'm learning, he's learning, we're all learning, and we're trying to also educate the public at the same time, which is, which is challenging because the public now has to become accustomed to, hey, there's this new way I can watch a musical, but it's not on Netflix because that's subscription and we don't want to do that. It's not on Hulu, but it is on iTunes and it is on Amazon because that's pay-per-view. Because just to backtrack slightly, this model has to be pay-per-view, can't be subscription, just because if people don't know when they're subscription services, it's great for us, the consumers, but it's, it's disastrous for artists because their royalties are drastically diluted and there's no way for them to actually win in that model. So we're trying to develop a model where people can win, where everybody can win and everybody can play fair. And that's great. But now, the moment we've been waiting for and we've been building up for, let's talk about No One Called Ahead. <laughs> yes. How did this project come about? Um, was it specifically made for streaming musicals or was it something that's been knocking around in your head for a while? I think it's a perfect example of why streaming musicals exist and why streaming exists. I've had this show knocking around for like seven, eight years that I, I, I thought it was very worthy of being done regionally somewhere felt fun for Off-Broadway, but look, who was going to put money into it? What was going to happen to it? Was it going to go to Broadway? Who was going to produce it? Can you attach a name director? I mean, it's competing with 10,000 other things that are sticking on people's desks. So, you know, it's okay. I, you know, I, I have a good relationship with regional theaters and I've been to Broadway. So I'm one of the lucky ones, but it still takes years to get a show somewhere. So, so streaming is what allowed me to do the show. But no, the truth is the, the original title of the show was Death, the Musical, which was very charming eight, nine years ago. And that was funny, but it's just sort of lost the funniness. But the idea actually came to me. I'm going to bring John Caird into it again. I was working on Daddy Long Legs um, at John's house in London. And after dinner, John likes to play the piano. He's a brilliant pianist. A lot of people don't know that. He plays classical music so, so well. So after dinner, he would sit in, in, you know, in his living room and, and play for like an hour. And this one particular night, he played for two hours. In the first hour, I was just listening to the music and just getting lost in Chopin and Schubert and Bach and and Schumann. And then the second hour, my mind started to wander, just listen to the music. And I, and I started to get the thought of like, I wonder if there were other Chopins and Schumanns and Schuberts that were never discovered, that their music was lost in an attic somewhere, or, or they never showed their music to anybody. And that was my first thought that triggered the whole idea. And it was just a random thought about like, are there other works of genius that we've never seen or heard? And of course there are. I mean, we know about it in our world, like great, great artists that most people have never heard of or, or never became famous. So I started to find to see if there was a story there. And I and, 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 and everything else just sort of built around that. I just kind of created the first scene of maybe it's this guy and he goes to a cabin and and maybe he's one of those artists. And and and, and the story, I, I sort of wrote the story as it goes along, because I'll never forget something. I read that Neil Simon said about storytelling and he said he always just thinks of the general idea and the characters and has a sense of things, but then he lets the characters decide where the story is going. And when I write original pieces, I always find that really useful. Like I do plot where things go, but once I start writing, I, I actually do hear the character's voice and they actually do tell me where they want to go, or at least that's the way I experience it. So I'm very, I'm very interested in that idea of having, of discovering a story as you write it. And this story just literally the story that came out the first time I wrote it is really the story that we're telling now. I mean, it's changed a bit over the years. I've refined it. I've thrown out a couple of songs, but the essence of the story came out very quickly and it's really the same story. And, um, and, and it's, and it's just, uh, it's, I guess it's one of my more personal stories because I relate to Ben a little bit or I relate to a guy like that. So it was fun to tell this story. And, and I was also interested, 
you know, in writing a contemporary musical because my roots are pop music. And most people know me from Jane Eyre and Daddy Long Legs and Emma, which I love doing, but I actually say that's a bit of an anomaly. I wasn't really writing that way. Um, but, but it was really fun to discover that harmonic world. So, but it was also really gratifying for me as a writer to come back to pop music and to write a show completely on guitar. Um, I wrote my first songs when I was 11 years old on guitar and, uh, and, and I still love going back and, 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 and making the music slightly simpler and, um, and it's just a different tone. So, and, and it's really fun for me with streaming to get to share the show with the world. I agree. Um, I, just a personal question. Like, I think we all have our like self-deprecating moments as artists. So do you ever worry that you're like possibly one of the unfor or the forgotten ones out there, unremembered <laughs> artists sometimes? Oh, absolutely. I <laughs> kind of like, you know, every second hour of the day. Um, I think maybe a few years ago, I did really what was living that world a lot thinking like, you know, what if nobody ever does my stuff or my work? I feel a little more secure now. And uh, obviously with licensing and streaming, and I'm excited about this opportunity, but I think all of us as artists get insecure from time to time. I, I have friends that are enormously excess, successful that, you know, have their moments of insecurity too. So mine are pretty normal, but, um, yeah, mostly it's being replaced with gratitude, but with no one called ahead, I think it allowed me in this piece to sort of say, to, to sort of share that angst, uh, you know, that Ben goes through of like, you know, what if I don't mean anything? And, and he, you know, he doesn't really think he means anything. Um, but, but, you know, all of us as artists, whether we're successful or famous, or we do it for fun or not, my best moments as an artist are when I'm creating, when I'm writing. I love opening night. I love working with, with actors and I love the process. All of that is, 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 is great and I, and, I, and I enjoy it tremendously. But the highest of highs is actually writing something and feeling good about it. And there's just, there's just no describing that feeling. And, and that is the essence of of I think what what art is and and part of what I want the audience to maybe take away from no one called ahead is that art is joy even though it's all of these other factors are involved and can there be fame can can I make a living will other people like it but art for just art's sake for just joy is ultimately a, a great message to share with the world mm -hmm. And now for the songwriting portion of this, were there any songs that like stumped you or like story elements? Because this is one of the few musicals that you also wrote the book for as well. Well, book, so to say, screenplay. Yes. Um, I, I, I started writing books uh, to my shows m with Emma, and I never thought I was actually going to write the book to Emma. Um, but when we did the first workshop of it, it worked so well, I went, oh, maybe, maybe I should do this. And I actually had a playwright come up to me, this woman, and said, you know, I came here because I was going to offer you my services, but you don't need me. And that was the first moment I sort of became confident, like maybe I could write a book to a musical. And of course, that was an adaptation. And then I adapted Sense and Sensibility and a couple of other things. But, but obviously, No One Called Ahead is a much different thing because that's an original piece and you just have to make up the whole thing. And it's pretty hard to do that um, and very, very challenging. Wait, but I sort of forgot what the question was. I think you asked me to. Um, was it harder to figure out where songs go since you're making it up as you go along? Yes, absolutely it is. And, and, and I couldn't figure out why for a while. But I realized because when I'm reading a novel and adapting a novel, I see, I see the song instantly on the page of the novel. Um, but when I'm writing an original story... Like everything is about the dialogue. It's not about a song. I'm not trying to write a song. I'm just trying to write a story. And so the songs were much harder because I was, instead of plagiarizing a famous author, I was plagiarizing myself, which wasn't as exciting. Um, I, I, I was just, I'm, I'm working with uh, um, a, a gentleman now who wants to do a book for a musical who, who's only done screenplays and teleplays. And he was asking me, like, how do I start? What do I do? And I said, just write it like you're writing a play. Just write a play. 
and don't write any songs. Don't write any song titles. Don't write any song ideas. Just write the play and let me find the songs. Because I think that's kind of the fun way that it happens is that if somebody is, is really writing a great monologue for somebody and it's a musical, I'm going to take that monologue and I'm going to plagiarize it. And I'm going to say, tell everybody, I wrote that lyric. But really, I will have drawn from somebody else's genius. And, and that's what these shows become. You don't know where the book started and the lyrics ended. It should all sound like one thing. So I've been enjoying writing every aspect, doing the book and the score to my later shows because, first of all, I don't argue with myself as much as I argue with other people. And it, and it just feels like more of an organic process. Even when I write with John and he eventually takes over the book, He's always good with me doing the first draft. Um, Night's Tale, the show we just did recently in Japan last year, <coughs> um, it was an original show. Um, but, I mean, loosely based on Two Noble Kinsmen. But, you know, we, we created our own version of it, our own story. So after meeting about it in England, he went, all right, now you go home and write it. So I wrote the book and the first draft of the score in six weeks. Then we get together with John, then John totally rewrites the book, and then we have our back and forth, and then he tells me all the songs I need to rewrite, and then that's how it happens. But when I'm doing it myself, obviously it's just less infighting, and, and what I do is then after I've finished writing a first draft, I'll step away from it for a few months, and then I'll go back to it, and I'll be able to really be objective when I go back and hear it fresh and go, oh, here, here's what's wrong, and this is how I can fix it. And then the next process is when it's on its feet, and then you really know when it's wrong. <laughs> All right, I got one last question for you before we wrap this up. Go ahead. What advice would you give to any up-and-coming musical theater composers that dream of like just getting their show staged one day? Don't give up. That's if I had to say one thing and I would say it a thousand times perseverance, don't give up because no matter who you are, how talented you are, things are going to go well and then things are not going to go well. And then the road to, to trying to get your first thing is so challenging and there's no other explanation for like, is it talent? Is it luck? Is it this person worked harder? No, it's just don't give up. Just keep going. And eventually if you have an assemblance of talent, it will be there. If you're one of those people when we watch American Idol and they're tone deaf and they don't know it and they think they're a great singer, then that's a different category. But if you have talent and you're good at what you do and you've received some encouragement, then just don't give up. And on that note, that's a great thing to end on. Paul, is there anything else you want to say before we head on out? Um, this was just very enjoyable. Thanks for asking such smart questions. And um, and just, you know, check out our streams. Check out Emma. Check out No One Called Ahead. And if you, if you appreciate and like what we're doing, even if these aren't your favorite musicals, but just spread the word to other people because we want this idea to take off for all of us because I think it helps our industry and, and it gives – writers and actors and artists and creatives and designers more opportunities to create so let's all support that and also please do jane Eyre as a streaming musical i want to show that to more of my friends oh we're talking about it it's gonna happen yeah absolutely and please stay in touch and thank you this was lovely and happy to do anything anytime all right. Thank you very much, Paul. I will, you enjoy the rest of your evening, and we'll see you next time on Musicals with Cheese.